what is the minimum? What, what are table stakes, guys, uh, to start building the foundation to provide a, a great candidate experience? I'll start with you, Sol. Yeah, I think uh, for us is recognizing that good isn't good enough, right? Uh, we, we aspire to be the best candidate experience in the world, period, right? We're uh, the best doctor's office. Some, someone's going to be the best. Why not us? And for that, that means that um, you really need to uh, pull apart every part of the experience, which means you need to understand your candidate journey. And we focus a lot of our effort making sure we understand every element of the journey and uh, formalizing that and structuring that so we can provide magic um, at the margin. Yeah, great. Should every candidate hear back from um, a recruiter? Is that table stake? So I think that a candidate should always hear back from a recruiter if they're in the later stages of the process. At the bare minimum, every single candidate that applies should know where they stand in the process. Right. But I think as you move forward, if a candidate comes on site, absolutely a recruiter or even a hiring manager should give that candidate a call and tell them what, they're, what is going on, like why they're being moved forward in the process. Raise your hand if you believe that there are still candidates out there that are not hearing, not just from our career, but at all. Oh boy. So yes, I mean, I, I think you know the black hole is a true thing. Right. Um, so why why does this matter? And I and I want to have you guys uh, do this. Turn to the person next to you, and say hi. Okay, good. Uh, and please talk, discuss this question. Yeah. In your opinion, what is the cost of not focusing on exceeding uh, the, the candidate expectations? So take about 40 seconds, and then we'll recap. Go. How's it going? Yeah. Good? So then you go. <coughs> yeah, I'll, I'll come in with the, yeah. the stat. Yeah. OK. How are you Practice. feeling? Good? good, good. It's only 500 people. Keep it interactive. I like it. Do a third. Make it easier to chat with you. All right, guys. All right, let's let's move on. How about a volunteer that that can share? What is the cost of not doing this? And and you can use the mic, please. Interaction, please. What is the cost of not doing it? Go ahead. Oh. Yes. Mm hmm. Right. Yep. Now you're not going to get that future talent either. It's, yeah, I mean, it just rolls downhill from there. Totally. And the reality is that if a candidate has a negative experience, they tell six or more people. If they have a good experience, they tell two or more people. So it's embedded behavioral psychology that if you have a negative story to tell, that you're going to tell more people. And if you think about the implications of social media, that reverberates across every single channel. So you're absolutely right. They tell their friends. They tell their family members. So ghosting a candidate. It's actually um, doesn't work. It's really funny. We were, uh, you know, for any given candidate, people don't really think about um, the effect. But like we were doing the math, we do twenty thousand interviews this year. We'll do so. That's twenty thousand opportunities to create kind of like good experiences or or pretty poor experiences or one hundred and twenty thousand bad comments, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this um, the, the the research done by the talent board in North America shows something that's very truth and that CEOs care about. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So and let's put the picture of the sad dog. <laughs> so, uh, so forty-six percent of candidates that say they have a negative experience with the company will be less likely to purchase those goods or services. So, if you actually want to scare your company, scare your management team. 
all you need to do is take a look at the pool of candidates that are pissed off with your candidate experience, multiply it by 46%, and then multiply it by the average sales price or, or cost uh, of purchasing your goods, and there you go. You have a quantification of what it means to have a negative candidate experience. Yeah. Uh, one quick anecdote is interesting. I was uh, working uh, very briefly with the NBA, and they were taking a look at their candidate pool and trying to map it to people who had actually purchased tickets and actual merchandise, and they found that if you were a fan and you had applied to a position there, you were three times the typical cart size of someone that didn't apply for that position. It's so crazy. So people who were actually fans and candidates spend three times as much. Got so it. if you can multiply it, it becomes pretty scary. Yeah. Have you ever had an amazing, extraordinary experience that you feel compelled to tell the manager to call someone to say, wow, that was awesome. And I want to tell you what that person did. Greenhouse team, you guys have exceeded our expectations. The, the way you, you have treated the audience, the way you have treated that's that's amazing, right? So we want to create that in our candidates. And I want to ask for some specific examples not just meet expectations, yeah. it's, it's, it's satisfy. I'm talking about exceeding expectations, right? So um, give me some examples. So what do you guys do? Yeah, so we have a, we formalized something, which some of you, you may do, but we, we created something we call the reverse interview, right? And it's kind of like what it sounds. Um, candidates, when they're in, especially the on-site phase, um, it's, it's very high stakes, it's very stressful. There's a, a weird power dynamic, right? Because you know, we're interviewing and they're being interviewed. And, and so we realize they don't get the questions answered they need. And sometimes they don't meet the people they want to meet. And so at the reference check phase, we say to them, hey, we have this reverse interview. Who in the company do you want to meet? And we'll actually make them available, anyone. That's great. Tell us about the wellness packet. Oh, yeah, we were chatting about this earlier. So we're a wellness brand and we um, we know companies um, offer like welcome kits or things like that for your on-sites, right? Uh, but we thought, yeah, that's okay. Uh, we want to do something a little different. So we created, uh, uh, we're creating three more things uh, in that. Number one is we're creating a mindfulness card, right? Because interviews are scary, they're intense. Uh, just an opportunity to be like, hmm. But on top of that card, we're throwing in a little note from the hiring manager with words of encouragement. To be like, hey, we're so glad you're here. Thank you so much for taking the time to meet us. We really appreciate it. Um, and then lastly, we're going to, um, in the notepad we give people, we're going to have thank you notes from interviewers. Mm. Right? It's a personalized thank you notes from interviewers because a lot of the time candidates spend their time thanking us, but we rarely spend our time thanking them. Yeah. yeah. It's beautiful. Do you have something to add? I mean, I think those are amazing ways to go above and beyond, but I just can't reiterate enough treating every single candidate like a unique snowflake, understanding as much as you possibly can about what they care about. I think we talk a lot of, in, as recruiters about developing personas, right? Like, you should develop a persona for your engineering talent, for your sales talent, for your marketing talent, but we don't actually understand the individual, the individualism of all of our candidates as well. What does this engineering candidate actually care about versus the next one? And so I think it's really taking the time to think through what is going to make this candidate really accept an offer at my organization? Do they like to drink coffee? Or we were talking about matcha tea. Right. Or uh, do they just like to have water when they come to our office? Really taking the time to understand what they care about is, is paramount. And yeah. then the last thing I'll say around it is just making them feel heard during the interview process. I think a lot of candidates, they'll go in, they'll answer specific questions. But what I like to usually ask a candidate is, what have I not asked you that I need to know about you as a candidate for this position? What else can you share with me? And I think what it gives them is an opportunity to really connect with that hiring manager, connect with the recruiter, and, and yeah. really let them know who they are. You, you were also referring to being very specific about asking that question as part of the application, right? At the end, yeah. ask, put it in, you know, is there anything else that you'd like to share with us that would help to get to know you better, right? Because the, the, the person can clarify 
you know, why there was a gap in unemployment or it's just another opportunity to make them feel heard, right? So at Whole Foods Market, this is, um, this is what I, how we approach recruiting. And I tell my team that we are not in the recruiting business, we are in the hospitality business. I want them to think about guests and not candidates, right? I spent a little time working at Disney and doing some consulting with the Ritz Carlton. And the, you know, it, it, it's hard to get personal, right? But there are ways to leverage resources to treat these candidates as guests. One of the things that we do in Austin, and we fly everybody that comes to a final interview uh, for an in-person panel, we have a partnership with a hotel chain called The Guild. And The Guild has high-res units at some of the very cool, fancy buildings in Austin. So as a candidate, you get to experience the Austin feel like. And you have a bigger pool, a nicer gym, but the, the Guild team um, asks questions like, what's your favorite music? You know, what do you like to eat? And obviously at Whole Foods Market, we have everything that um, you can imagine. We put packets together. When the guests come into the room, uh, they'll have playing their, their favorite band, right? This is a concept that they stole from, um, from Joada B, Chip Conley's um, hotel boutique chain. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in the back, see if we know that they have a, a dog, we put a little, you know, toy for the dog. And those are the things that, you know, they remember. And it, it doesn't cost us anything because they, they leverage their resources. Um, and as a team, we, we, we set this aggressive goal as, as you, so right? Yep. Like, you have to set the goal with your teams around being uh, at the best at providing a great candidate experience. If you see at the top of our pillar, you know, our actualization is to really serve both the team leaders and the candidates. So this is uh, tricky, right? So how do you measure the candidate experience? You know, what, what are some important metrics that uh, you use to, to measure this? Yeah, so, so uh, you know, obviously you know, many recruiters and recruiting leaders like, like myself talk a lot about time to fill. We talk a lot about um, you know, other things like that. But for us, because candidate experience is key, we wanted to figure out how to um, figure out how excited are people about the experience. And so we used a synthetic of what's called net promoter score. Is that uh, fam people familiar with that, the idea of net promoter score? Well, OK. Well, Raise your answer. hand. All right, so All right. most of you. But the question is, on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being high, how likely is that you would recommend a friend or a colleague Whole Foods Market as a place to yeah. work, right? And you guys use Greenhouse. We use Greenhouse Survey Tool, and we originally just used it for on-site, and then we realized, like, this is dumb, right? We've got, we've got to see everything. And so the moment any single candidate touches, you know, speaks to, not touches, uh, speaks to a, a, a person at One Medical, after they finish their process, a survey goes out, and every single Sunday, I literally read every bit of feedback. So if you, come, if you apply one medical and you send in feedback, the head of recruiting reads everything. And not just that, we've then looked at this net promoter score by stage. So we're, we're trying to figure out where in the process are things breaking. It's not just that the entire process or the entire candidate is breaking, it's exactly where so we can target that. Got it. So Saul, I have a question because you know some people use NPS, some right. people find it a little bit controversial. Right. Why don't you just ask specific questions about the candidate experience at every single stage? Why don't you use the typical survey tool? Yeah, so we so we did. We used to. Um, great question. Uh, right now, for us, we wanted to um, reduce friction in the entire process, and so uh, we're leveraging greenhouse, but we're always open to uh, testing and trying. And we do a lot of that. Yeah. All right, let's ask you guys, same exercise. Yeah. Turn to your partners and tell us, how do you guys are measuring uh, the candidate experience? Let's spend another 40 seconds. Awesome. Feel good? Okay. Mm -hmm. You good? Feel good? Yeah. Is it going the way you want it? Yeah. Okay. Now, we'll spend a little more time with technology and the everyone is a recruiter. Okay. And the questions will be good, I think. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, because they're already talking. 
they're practicing yeah. talking. Like, so if you practice talking, then you're more likely to actually get up and totally, talk. Totally. So. <coughs> I can see Alex who works here at One Medical in the, in the white in the second tables, oh. talking up a storm. She's a second table over there, okay. she's pointing. Second table to the All right. All right, we got someone with a mic right there. Who's got a very cool way that they're using to measure the candidate experience? Can you please volunteer? I mean, I heard you talking, so you have a lot of ideas on a lot of things. So, <laughs> someone share. Don't be shy. Repeat the question. How are you measuring the candidate experience? Okay. What's that? Badly. badly. Oh, badly, badly. So uh, whether you use I, a ver oh, go ahead. Oh, um, for us at FabFitFun, we're actually using in Greenhouse the candidate survey tool. So we're currently using that to measure candidate experience. And it has really great functionality where you can filter. We're starting small. We're not sending the survey to every department or every one coming on site. But we're just starting to see what this metrics and data look like to get some initial intel. And hopefully, we'll be sending it to all of our teams and departments candidates. Cool. I've heard of Greenhouse. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. I, I really like this quote. And I, I told these guys that I, I'm the one that's going to bring the human side to this. You know, metrics are metrics. But this is one of the most important decisions that you are helping someone make, right? If, if, if they're looking for a calling, if they're looking for, for that place, right? So it, it's like when you get married, it's like when you decide on something very profound. So this quote, to me, exemplifies you know, that not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted, right? On a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being high, how much do you love your wife? Well, gee, 9, it's going to get you in trouble. 10, you know, it's like some <coughs> things are priceless. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that, Danielle? <laughs> Well, I think, uh, I think that empathy is super important as well as authenticity in the process. And it's hard to measure both of those, right? It's, it's difficult. But, um, you know, I think the real test is looking around you inside of your organization. Like if you wake up every single day and you look around and people are actually happy to be there, they feel as though they're tied to a mission, you know, people actually want to hang out with people outside of work. For me, you have a really good foundation to build a great candidate experience and recruit amazing people. It all comes from the DNA of your organization. Yeah. And, you know, like you said, that's, that is truly difficult to measure. And I think, you know, management tries and put a, you know, puts pressure on recruiting teams to say, show me your dashboard, show, show me these amazing, you know, tableau metrics that you've put together. <laughs> Saul so uses tableau, that's why I'm mentioning it. But at the end of the day, I, I think sometimes you just feel it. Like, can I recruit for this organization? Do I believe in what they're doing? Can I empathize with the people around me? And uh, can, I, can I be a part of something that's greater yeah. than myself? Yeah, and, and when you care, you, know, you, you go out of the automated process. Like when you're dating your spouse and you send her flowers, right? It's not like you schedule, maybe some of us do, and you know, the delivery to go out every third Thursday of the month. No, the thought is what counts. And your best recruiters, I bet you, are the ones that will check in with the candidates on a text. Hey, it's been a long journey. How's it going? I'm here to support you. Just <coughs> caring. And I'd lo love to ask you this question, Sol, because you talked about the attributes that you look for when you hire people on mm -hmm. your team. That's right. So um, three big things for us. So we do competency-driven recruiting. We're very structured in that way. But the big three are uh, for the person to be human-centered, to see more than just what's sitting in front of them. Uh, number two, recruiters have got to have courage. You've got to stand up and be willing to say no sometimes to hiring managers and to interviewers and people like that. And then lastly, um, anyone that sits back and, and is reactive to any situation is probably not best for recruiting on my team. You have to step up and be action-oriented and really take charge of a situation, take, especially as it relates to candidates. And so we, we check for all of those very specifically. Yeah. The DNA of your teams have to include people that 
care, right? On my team, I hired someone intentionally that came from hospitality, and she loves, you know, sending nice messages to this candidate. She was the one that um, thought about this partnership with the hotels because she's a hotelier at heart, right? So, but technology helps, right? It does. Um, again, you know, we're not dealing with a purchase of a car or a purchase of a purse. Now, unfortunately, sometimes executives spend more time looking at a car and buying a purse than actually hiring people, you know? Right. Um, but it's really interesting that there's a lot of similarities between, between automation and how we're helping you make a decision to, you know, buy a movie on Netflix or um, shop at Amazon with, by giving you suggestions. Uh, but I think we, we have to think beyond that. Yeah. Because right? we're, we're talking about one of the most important decisions that somebody will make. So what do you have to say about that? How do we leverage technology to keep the process human, but automate the volume, right? Yeah, uh, it's, it's important. So I think the key is first to map out the candidate journey and then figure out which pieces of the process should be automated. So by the way, not every single part of your process should include automation. And that also means having restraint. Avoid the buzzwords. Not everything needs to include artificial intelligence. Not every single position, not every single stage. And as a, someone who builds technology, it's kind of weird for me to say that. It feels like it's, it's a bit of a, a paradox. But um, be very careful about how you implement it. Um, another thing that I believe people need to do is actually put their candidates through whatever process, like on a small scale, before you roll it out uh, to a bunch of positions. Um, but I do think that with some of the new tools out there, you can be more personalized. Like technology is getting better and better. It will know uh, that the candidate had applied to your company before and that they're a referral from Michael and that Michael is in another department. And so if you choose the right tools, if you choose the right technology, you can give the candidate a great experience. Uh, but the last thing that I would encourage you to do is not just buy a bunch of technology tools and try and bolt them on a system to Together because what that does for a candidate experience is it's almost like you're calling for customer service and Peggy answers the phone and then she can't solve your problem and then Michael answers the phone and then he basically passes you off to Simon. And so think about how your systems work together. Do they integrate with Greenhouse? Can they speak to one another? Maybe you can buy one platform that can do three or four things and give the continuity of that experience and of that interface. And then when I think about this triangle, which by the way, I'm going to credit uh, Elliot Garlock uh, from Wayfair for creating this uh, paradigm. Uh, he taught me a few things about the intersection of technology, people, and process. So it's not just enough to choose the technology and even map it out into your candidate journey the right way, but you have to have the right people that intersect with how you utilize it. Like, do you have the right recruiters at the right stages thinking about how to leverage this technology, and do you have the ideal process whereby technology can be optimized. Uh, a really funny story I heard from this woman who had run talent for a retailer was when she implemented chatbots for the first time. She basically implemented them and said, yeah, so we're hiring everybody for our store locations that the chatbot recommends. It's like, ah, uh, okay. <laughs> um, so all of a sudden she started getting a bunch of complaints from the store managers who were like, yeah, so we were hiring all these people that the bot and the AI said we should hire, but they're turning out not to work well for us. And so she had to take a step back and say, okay, well, where does the intersection of the process I want versus the people interactions versus the technology I choose, where does that create this uh, beautiful triangle? So I would urge you to consider this. I love it, yeah. Um, so we talked about the, the, the risk of uh, affecting sales, right? Right. How do you get your wellness packets and how do you get buy-in for the things that you do? Yeah, so this is a big topic. Everyone says you need to get buy-in and no one seems to be able to do it. It's kind of like Sisyphus, you know, moving the rock up and getting it knocked back down. And for us, we actually, uh, 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 we had a spark. We realized that the um, candidates interact with lots of people at One Medical, but only 20% of the time with recruiters. And so we realized 
everyone has to be a recruiter, right? And the, the way to get buy-in to be everyone to be a recruiter is we needed to become marketers internally. And so <laughs> literally spent three months um, at every single management meeting with every single leader in my company, and I walked them through this concept that everyone's gonna be a recruiter from here on out, right? It is the way we're gonna do, we're gonna orient around candidates, not specifically around, we're gonna partner with our hiring managers, but orient around candidates. And then we made a tactical tweak, and this is what changed everything. And um, actually, Alex in the audience is a recruiter with me, and she can attest to this. What we did is, for a period of six months, to open a requisition at One Medical, I needed to personally sign off on the job post. Not the post itself, but physically turning it on to go online. And to get to that point, you had to have competencies put in place, an interview plan, a clear language around selling this job, a clear in, uh, interview um, prep, uh, hiring manager and, uh, and recruiter prep meeting done, and then lastly, uh, quite simply, uh, um, interview or prep. And what that did was that helped the organization understand that like, you know, recruiting's important. We don't just throw stuff up and pray. And what ended up happening was um, that uh, our velocity of recruiting improved dramatically. We're talking like 20, 30% per recruiter. That's awesome. I love that concept. Everyone is a recruiter. When you come to Whole Foods Market, not if, when you come to visit me, I'd love to give you a tour. And that's one of the tactics. We just chatted about that. Yeah, that's one of the tactics that I use to get candidates you know, to actually fall in love with our brand. And what I do is basically let our senior leaders, let, let our team members tell, tell the story. This is a picture actually of Kathy Strange. If you like cheese, she is the most well-renowned person in the world about cheese. So um, she leads our global specialty team. So imagine someone like her you know, talking to a candidate about something that she's so passionate about, right? Um, another example, you know, the foundations of leaders that represent, you know, what we do with uh, whole kids, whole, whole planet, whole city. This is what really makes candidates believe or, or think, wow, this is a place where I would choose right. to spend, you know, a lot of hours of but, my day. But the key, Andre, is to figure out what candidates care about. Some candidates may care about cheese, and other candidates may care about the nonprofit right. work of Whole Foods. So it's That's really getting to understand it. You know, as uh, someone who's a vegan right here, I probably wouldn't want to meet her and learn about cheese. About cheese. So, Good um, point. But you know, I'll take you to talk to John Mackey. That's, he, that's RCO the candidate experience. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, triggers Very and good motivations point. are key. Truly understanding the motivation and trigger. We spend a lot of time training our recruiters on that. Yeah. I'd love to leave some time for some questions, guys. Really, this has been awesome. It actually worked out well. And in summary, these are the right. five things that uh, we want you guys to take with you. And on Monday, when you go back to your office, please um, you know, start setting some goals. Don't be in the recruiting business. Be in the hospitality business. Leverage technology, call Daniel. You've always been so awesome with me when I call you for advice. And, um, and many, many of you here will have um, awesome insights on the technologies that are out there to affect the candidate experience. Uh, talk to your companies, talk to your team leaders about becoming a recruiter. And obviously measure, measure the candidate experience to specifically not deliver data, but insights. So with that, um, this is our contact info, one more time, but please, let's take some questions from, from you guys. Yes? I think there's either side, there are uh, uh, microphones. And say your name and where you're from. My name's Karen and I work um, at January Digital, which is a digital marketing startup. So my question for you is around employer branding versus internal branding when it comes to the interview process. We've had a couple instances where a candidate is several stages into the process and through informal conversations, employees uh, in their network have learned unfavorable things about the candidate and no longer want to meet with them. What's the balance there, mm. pulling the interview, ruining your employer brand, but also respecting our employees and their time? Uh, I, can, I can take you it. You can take okay. a step. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we get this a lot. Um, the reality is um, 
if your employee kind of doesn't understand, I'm going to put it, uh, um, doesn't understand that they're in a, uh, uh, that, that ultimately like the brand is everything um, that they engage with and everyone they engage with, then it makes sense to say it's not worth meeting this person. But if you go and cancel an interview late stage, I promise you that candidate is going to go tell all their friends and going to create a bad um, vibe about your company. And so explaining it in that context to an employee, I, I think, is, is helpful. It's less about the hiring anymore. Now it's just about, hey, you as an employee can actually create a bad brand outcome for you know, your company. Yeah. And that, that changes dynamic. I I just think that sometimes it's about context. And so I think you, sometimes you need to explain, well, you may have heard these negative things about this candidate at this company at this time, but our company is different. And this role may be different. And this team dynamic may be different. I mean, at the end of the day, like we've all had jobs. And some of us have, in different companies. And some of us has, have excelled in some of them and worked great under amazing leaders. And others, you know, I'll even admit I had a job once where, I'll, I'll be honest, I wasn't as, as awesome as uh, I was at my prior job. And it really just depends. So I think when you're having that conversation with the people internally, you have to explain to them, not every past experience is a good indicator of the present and the future. And please give someone an opportunity and be open to the fact that the context might have changed. It's dangerous to think otherwise. Actually, yeah. that's where, um, Danielle, that's where competency-driven recruiting really helps. You can say, look, we care about these things. Yep. Right? At that company, they probably cared about these other skills right, and these other experiences. Absolutely. Awesome. We got time for another question. Yeah. It's like the long walk to freedom. Nice jacket. Yeah. It's pretty. Way to be brave. Hi, my name is Liz. I work at Komodo Health. We're a health tech startup um, reducing the disease burden by creating the most actionable healthcare map. And so my question is uh, twofold. So first one is, how would you suggest um, kind of bouncing back from a bad candidate experience? And then my second question is, um, how do you convey feedback about culture fit, right? So how do you explain that to a candidate without offending them and like also without tainting your brand? Um, yeah, we, we, just, we actually just finished uh, uh, bias training in our company, so I think the great question, so I'll answer the second one first and maybe uh, pass it on. Um, so culture fit is a funny term because a lot of the time it's just kind of code for implicit bias, this idea of like, eh, I don't want to grab beer with you, right? Uh, and so the, the first thing to do, number one, is just define it. Now, how do you give feedback on it is a, a separate thing. Once you've like, objectively defined your cultural elements, Right? and maybe this candidate is no longer, a, it isn't a culture ad, then you can you know, give feedback to a candidate uh, based on um, those cultural elements, uh, you know, specifically and objectively. One thing we do, though, is we train every recruiter how to give feedback. We actually have scripts in it, and we have a, an interesting little tactical lead-in, if, if I may, just uh, two seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, we, say thing, we say, you know, thank you so much for being willing to do feedback with us. I shouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> Uh, we want to pay it forward at One Medical because we know many companies are nervous to give it, but, but we give it. Uh, two things before we start. Number one, I as a recruiter wasn't in all your interviews. So it's possible that I may say something at second hand, so bear with me. And secondly, you may have a skill, right, or behavior um, that, that's real, but we didn't see it in the interview, right? Interviews aren't perfect, but the best we have and the best truthfully that most companies have. And so bear with us. And so that tends to help both in terms of defining culture and then you know, delivering feedback back on it. Yeah, I, I think this is a challenging one for us. And I have to admit that we probably don't do as good of a job, but to stay safe, right? You, you right. have to you know, use the, the words and the advice from your legal team right. so you don't, you don't get any trouble. I, I think we should train people uh, on, on how to provide feedback. But to be honest, we say, Sorry, our decision was based on the strength of the candidate pool. There were other, and leave it as that, right? Um, yeah, the volume obviously is, is something that 
uh, has to be taken into account. Uh, with candidates that we bring to, to Austin for final interviews, we, the, the team leader has to get on the phone with them and have a chat about why they were not selected, right? Good Thanks, question, again. thank you. Hello, over here. Hi. <laughs> My name is Kelly, I work in recruiting Kelly. at Honey Science, we're based in LA. Um, I had a question, and forgive me if I missed it, but you had us talk about measuring the candidate experience. Um, how do you guys do that at your companies? Yeah, we also use the Net Promoter Score. Uh, send what? The, Sorry. The Net Promoter Score is just net. one question, so we can understand who are the detractors, who are the yeah. neutrals, and who are our brave fans, right? Um, and we moved away from asking more questions because candidates are getting way too many you know, things in front of them. And it just helps us kind of keep it simple. Um, and this is actually, you know, when you stay at a hotel, that's the question that you get asked. When you get back from, you know, Southwest Airlines will send you that net promoter score. Are there better ways to do it? Yes, but I think um, th that one is kind of for us the one that has worked. One of the ones that I really like is retention in the hiring process. So like if you put a Kennedy Experience initiative in place and you want to see of the candidates you want to move from stage to stage, what percentage of them are actually moving forward in the process. So a good one would be, let's say, even offer to acceptance because we know that a candidate who has a good experience is 38% more likely to accept a job offer at that company company versus even having like a mediocre experience. So if you can measure conversion from funnel touch point to touch point, it's also a good way to test whether your programs are working and not working. Yeah, and then, then one more um, kind of time in process is a relatively strong proxy for experience. Yep. From the moment they apply to the moment they know that they're either hired or, or did, not, did not get the job. That, that time, you'd be amazed once you add it up how long it can be. And if you're a candidate and you're waiting two months to get hired, that's, that's way too long for most people. Not for all people, but for most people. Most people are out of the process by then. Right. That was really helpful. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. With that final thought, thank you guys. You guys are amazing. Thank you. But you're thank amazing. you for staying with us until the end. Thank you. <laughs>